in order to get a sense of this gospel, a grasp of what Jesus was discussing with the Pharisees about divorce, may it be helpful to start with an analogy. So I acknowledge it's a very uh, close to home subject or very real and sensitive for some of us, including myself. But analogy may help us just get a sense of what Jesus is trying to do here. So imagine we're waking up one day and we walk around town and then we see everyone driving their cars with flat tires. The rubber is shedding off the rims, the rims are all getting all dented, but everyone is going about their lives thinking that this is just normal. After all, everyone's flat tires look kind of the same, so it must be the case that everyone has just accepted it as the norm and have chosen to live their lives as if it's just the way it is, it's not ideal, but it's just the way the world works. This analogy is one way to frame the gospel because what's happening is that the Pharisees are questioning Jesus about marriage and why Moses allowed them to divorce. Jesus' reply is quite key because he's saying, you know, he says, it was because we were so unteachable and it's because of our own hardness of heart that Moses wrote this commandment. But then he says this key line, But from the beginning, it was not so. From the beginning, it was not so. In effect, he's saying something like this. He's saying, you know, do you think that all the tension that we go through, the conflict and heartache that happens in marriage and relationships, do you think that's a normal thing? Have we come to just accept that this heartache and the heartbreak that comes as just the way it is? He's saying, no, this is not a normal thing. This is not what God intended and created from the beginning. Something has gone terribly wrong with our hearts. So applying this analogy, Jesus is saying to the Pharisees, you know, back in the beginning, we all had airs in our tires. It was a full tire. We were all operating in the way that he was intending, but we lost that. His words is that if we want to know the real meaning of what it means to have a one flesh union, we have to go back to the beginning to see what God originally intended before this thing called original sin happens and changes things. And Father Greg and I were having a chat. Normally we we come up with all our ideas about events and things um, while we're vegetating on the couch late at night after a long day. And we're just thinking, you know, we we probably should do a series on what uh, people have come to know as theology of the body, which is St. John Paul II's big teaching on the nature of life and love, marriage and sexuality, theology of the body. Some of you would have heard of it. Some of you have looked into it already. At the men's night last Tuesday, people were expressing a desire to want to know more. The youth have been asking for it. And it's such a revolutionary teaching. It's probably one of the most impactful teachings and life-transforming teachings that has come from a, from a pope in recent years. You know, I've met and seen countless lives be transformed by it, relationships and marriages healed and restored by really getting a vision of JP2's um, articulation about how God originally inten- intended the human family. I've had friends that have um, left careers so they can start up ministries preaching what John Paul II was saying in his teaching and there's all these universities as well have come out of nowhere that have been erected really just to focus on life, marriage and family in honour of JP2. Because you know the perception that we get when it comes to these themes from, from the church is that you know the church is teaching on these matters, you know, we kind of reduce it to this series of prohibitions, these, you know, thou shall not, we're not allowed to do this, we can't do this, and if we just follow these prohibitions, if you don't do them, then you'll we'll be good Catholics. But John Paul II understands, you know, life is very messy. These things um, bring, can be, bring heartache and brokenness and the wounds are very much real. It's a real sensitive matter for so many of us. But he also says that we can't just settle there. We can't just settle with this kind of flat, deflated tire. We need to look at a real positive vision to strive for. And what he does is that he presents this entire vision of God's plan for love and for life. And his point is that, you know, we, we need to look at the entire story. We need to know what did God intend from the beginning, how that changed, and what Jesus has come to, to rectify and to heal it. And this is what he means, what we mean by the theology of the body. What does it mean to have a body? What does it mean to express ourselves with our bodily nature? And he goes, okay, well, let's look back at the beginning, the creation text. You know, for some of us, 
Um, when we look at Genesis, there's so many things we can look at. It was the first reading today, and there's so many. We can spend weeks just really examining the beauty of these initial creation accounts, whether we can look at the poetic value of it, the Hebrew language, like the inner psychology, what's going on behind it, and it's ultimately its implications for, for love and for marriage and human um, sexuality. Theology of the Body, uh, JP2, when he, when he brought it, it was actually 129 lectures that he gave over several years of Wednesday audiences. But 25 of those lectures were specifically focused on our first reading, on the, the story of Adam and Eve, really unpacking the beginning, what was the beginning. So he's following Jesus as kind of example. From the beginning, it was not so. Let's look at what God initially said in the beginning. So when we do that, we'll discover so many truths about what God originally ten intended about the human person, about the human heart, and our desire for love and for union. That before we have this thing called original sin, there were these other original experiences, positive and good experiences, before sin actually happened. We need to know what those experiences are so we get a sense of really what we were called to and therefore what Christ has done to heal it and to bring it back to, uh, um, to what God originally intended. So just to an overview, you can spend, we can spend a lot of time on this when we introduce this probably this time next year, I mean uh, early next year. Adam and Eve realized some, some real profound truths about themselves and about reality. One is that Adam and Eve realized that there's no one else like them in creation, that each of us are unique. Humanity is unique before all of creation, that we're the only ones who can relate with God and therefore we're, we're made to be in union with God. But at the same time, we're also made for communion and intimacy with one another, this one flesh. It is not good that man should be alone. Originally, the heart was not suspicious and guarded. It said that in Genesis, they were naked in the garden, but they were not ashamed. They were not ashamed. It's saying that, you know, originally the heart was transparent. There was no sense of shame or self-defensiveness. There's no suspicion when you're looking at the opposite sex with a kind of guardedness. There was a sen sense of authentic freedom and beauty. And he's saying that all these original experiences that we find in the original stories, they echo within us because we desire for these things. We long for it and we hope for it but at the same time our reality speaks of the bad news original sin has introduced this kind of deflation of the heart like a flat tire our hearts are now weakened they're now suspicious they're guarded protective lustful possessive selfish irrational self-gratifying and that has played out throughout all of human history and especially relationships brokenness in our families promiscuity dis the destruction of life and this is this kind of flat tire syndrome we just assume that's just the way it is and we just put up with it but really the good news and the part of the whole story of God's plan for salvation is precisely is that Christ has come to appeal to our wounded and broken human hearts and it's this theology of the body that Christ kind of speaks to, this idea that Christ has come precisely to heal and redeem the wounded and brokenness of our hearts and bodies. He wants to restore the authentic vision of life and love and then give us the strength to also live it out as he does so by giving his own body and his own heart, especially as we receive him in the Eucharist today. So as we turn towards the Eucharist, as Jesus gives us his own body and blood that we commune with him, let us remember that really it's the heart is the realm that only God and Christ can heal, that no psychologist or counsellor, they can only take us so far that really the wounded heart is the prerogative of Christ, that when it comes to these matters, we can't just rely on our own strength and our resources, we can't flourish driving flat tires. Christ has come to reinflate that, to heal us from the very root. So let us turn towards the Eucharist, receive his body, and pray and receive that grace of healing, especially for our own hearts and bodies in this Mass today. Amen.